Uh, hello, my name is Alex Terzilin uh, from NYU, and welcome to the Novel Machine Learning Approaches session. In this session, we'll have six presentations, but before we start uh, the presentations, just quick reminder, in case you have questions, please go to the Q&A session in Woha and post them there. So we'll pick your questions in the uh, online mode. Uh, and without any further ado, let's start the session. The first presentation is called PERS, Personalized and Expected Recommender Systems for Improving User Satisfaction uh, uh, by the team from NYU and from Alibaba. And the speaker is Pan Lee from NYU. Pan, please go ahead. You want to share your screen? Hi, everybody, and welcome to our presentation. So I'm Pan Li. I'm the fourth year PhD student at NYU Stern School of Business. And this paper is a joint work between NYU Stern and Alibaba. And we are going to present you a novel recommender system that will incorporate the concept of unexpectedness. So what is unexpectedness, and why do we need unexpectedness? And here's an example. So imagine we buy a briefcase online, and this is this is basically a screenshot of the purchase uh, website. And after you make your purchase, you will see suddenly the website will recommend you with all types of different briefcases. But you don't actually need another briefcase at all because you have already bought one. And that's what we call some kind of repeated recommendation. And we don't want those kind of recommendations. We want to get something novel, something unexpected. And also if you attended the Kindle speech, uh, this morning, the speaker was talking about the phenomenon of polarized filter bubble. So basically, if you stick with a certain opinion, I recommend the system will just basically reinforce the opinion over and over again. And you will stick to that zoom and you cannot get out of it. So to sum up, the classical collaborative filtering algorithms, they will lead to the problem of over-specialization, filter bubbles, and also user bottom. Well, unexpected, unexpected recommender system, they aim to provide novel and satisfying recommender system to get target users at the same time. And how do we do that? So before we jump into the model, we'll first present our definition of the unexpectedness, where we take a latent embedding point of view. So the unexpectedness in our paper is modeled as, a new, as the distance between the new item to the previous, to the past transactions of all the previous um, purchase items and in the latent space. So the closure of user interest is key during our uh, modeling of the unexpectedness. And how do we model the user interest? So there are two ways to do that. One simple way is we can just take the aggregation of all previously consumed item embeddings as we did in the last year's Rexis paper. But in this year, we take another step and we propose to do a clustering of all previously consumed item embeddings to identify the heterogeneity in the user's interest. So here's an example. As you can see, the red points, they really represent the user's past transactions. And if we take one single latent closure, it might be too much. It might cover lots of unnecessary contents of the user interest. But when we model the user interest as a clusters, we really, we really um, identify the heterogeneity of the user's interest and can model the user interest more efficiently. And we also pointed out there are two important factors during our modeling, which is the personalized factor and the session-based factor. Why is that? Because some people, they just tend to be value seekers. And whenever you present them with something interesting, they will just click on it. But the other people, they might be old, old style and they, they just want to stick to their comfort zone. They don't want to discover or explore more of the novel, novel items. And therefore we need to treat those different groups of people separately. And there are also the importance of the session based on expectedness. For example, if the users continue watching the TV episode, you might want to just recommend the next TV episode. You don't want to disturb the users with some kind of novel or maybe in that case, irrelevant recommendations. But in another case, if the users have been binge watching the same TV episode over, the, over one single night, 
the user might want to take a rest and might want to jump into something different. And that's why the unexpectedness comes in to solve those kind of problems. So here's basically our utility function to tackle the problem. So the first term IUI is the standard crystal rate estimation term, which estimate the, uh, how likely the user will click on the item. But we also add the second term, which we call the unexpected term. So the unexpectedness is calculated as a distance from the new item to the clusters of user interest, as we discussed before. And we also have this unexpected factor, which captures the personalized and session-based user perception towards the unexpectedness. And finally, we create a novel activation function to adjust the value of unexpectedness input. So why do we need this unexpected activation function? So the idea of our design is that we don't want the recommendation to be too irrelevant, too irrelevant and we also don't want the recommendation to be too similar. So we want the recommendation to lie into some kind of middle field to let the user feel it is something interesting, but it's also not something totally irrelevant. And we identify four important mathematical properties in our paper, which is continuous bounded unit model and short tailed. So this is basically our base model to estimate the crystal rate. So basically have the embeddings for the user features, for the historic behaviors, for the item features, and we use a self-attentive GRU to concatenate all those kind of latent embeddings to obtain the final RUI output. And this is really our proposed unexpected, unexpectedness model, which consists of two terms. So the first term, the unexpectedness, as the unexpected I down below. So it's basically calculate the distance from the item, item embeddings to the clusterings. And there's also this unexpected factor, which basically we concatenate the user features, item features, and the short window of historic behaviors. And we go through another layer of self-attentive multi-layer perception to get the final output of the unexpected factor, which really consists of the personalized and session-based information. So we conduct extensive experiments uh, to evaluate the performance of our data sets, uh, which include Yelp, MovieLens, and Alibaba. And we conduct time stratified cross validation and evaluate the performance to accuracy metrics, including AUC, hit rate, and also novelty based metrics such as unexpectedness and coverage. And compared with two groups of baselines, basically the unexpected recommendation baselines and also the click through rate prediction baselines. So here's basically our results. So our findings show that our proposed Pierce model not only outperformed the other baselines in terms of the unexpectedness measures, but also improve their user satisfaction as well, as we can see significant and consistent improvements in AUC and hit rate. Uh, we also conduct an extensive online A-B test uh, last year from November to December at Alibaba. And we evaluate the performance. So the application is the short video rec application, uh, short video rec recommendation application. And we evaluate the uh, performance using four business metrics, including the video view, the time span, the impression depth, and the click through rate. So, in all those four business metrics, we can see significant improvements over the current production system at Alibaba. And also, we see a significant improvement in the unexpectedness and coverage metrics as well. And that leads to the deployment of our model. So, the proposed model is actually in production at Alibaba. So to conclude the talk, we propose an industrial unexpected recommender system that is able to provide novel and satisfying recommendations at the same time. And also we conduct extensive offline and online experiments to demonstrate the power of our proposed model, which leads to this industrial deployment. And that's all for the talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for finishing on time, uh, Pam. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you. The first question is from Mahit Sharma, who asked you, how is the ground truth label for unexpectedness constructed for model training? Uh, yeah, I think that's a very good question. So I can go back to the model, uh, to the, uh, maybe to this part. So the unexpectedness is like a cons so the unexpectedness is a additional term that we add into the model as a regularizer. So we don't actually have a ground truth for the unexpectedness. But we, what we can what we do observe is, a, is that we can observe the final recommendation performance. So as you can see in our results section here, we can we can identify 
the unexplained serves as a degree that we can show how how novel the final recommendation is. And also we can see the improvement in AUC and hybrid, then that also provide as a ground shoot to evaluate the performance of the recommended system. And I hope that could address the problem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the second question is from uh, Shu Jun Wang. He asked you, how do you determine unexpected factor UJ, UI, sorry. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I can explain this unexpectedness factor a little bit more. So what we really want to do is that we want to, we want to address the uh, heterogeneity towards user perceptions, because some users, they like the unexpected recommended system, they are right seekers. Some users, they are old-fashioned, old they just want to stick to their comfort zone. So here we have this user embeddings. Uh, uh, where we take into account doing our proposed self-attentive multi-layer perception, which basically when we output the value of the unexpectedness factor, we take into account the user feature information. Uh, so that's the personalized part. And the session-based part is that, uh, as we have suggested, the user's uh, past behaviors, and especially the most recent behaviors, plays a crucial role during the user's perception towards unexpected recommendations. So here we have this sliding window and we take the most recent user behaviors into account as well. So what we finally do is that we can catenate the user embeddings, the user's recent behaviors, as well as the item embeddings, the recommended item. And we feed them into this layer and we get output of the unexpected factor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is, uh, how do you cluster the history behaviors? Uh, the question asked by Louis Wang. Uh, I guess my interpretation of this is how do you build these clusters? If you go to the first one of the first few slides with blue and red dots, uh, mm -hmm. can you just explain how you cluster uh, these behaviors? Or what is in figure C in this diagram? Mm -hmm. At least yeah, that's a, interpretation yeah, that's a, of the question. Yeah, sure. That's a very good question. So basically the algorithm we use is the mean shift algorithm, which is the unsupervised uh, clustering algorithm. The reason we use that, we use mean shift is that uh, we don't really require the number of clusters. So we don't need the input of explicit how many clusters we want to do to get the user interest. And uh, the details is, is in the paper. But um, one thing I want to mention here is that the clustering is done on the latent embeddings. So when we did the clustering, it's basically when we are clustering the user embeddings in the latent space. So, so that's how we just directly apply the mean shift algorithm. Uh, uh, the next question is, could you explain a bit more about users and items features? Uh, yes, so yeah, I can go to this experiment experiment part. So I can use Alibaba as an example. So the, so the user feature they have, for example, consists of the user demographics. And also they have the uh, uh, commonly defined user features, which I cannot share here, but there are something like the user's um, behavioral features. There are like the uh, user's uh, hobbies and yeah, something like that. So the item features really is, for example, in the video recommendation application, the item features include the topic of the video, the length of the video, durations, uh, the popularity of the videos, and so on. So they're, they're basically the standard features we use to construct the video recommendation system. Okay, thanks. And the last question, actually there are two questions which probably in at least my interpretation, you can combine into one Will the user be able to ask for expected versus novel questions? And the related question, is unexpectedness inversely proportional to similarity? So the question is about like the trade-off between expectedness versus unexpectedness, novelty and similarity versus unexpectedness. Can you address these two questions in one answer? Yeah, yeah, sure. So going back to this utility function. So 
So our idea is really that we want to use the unexpectedness as a regularizer. So we want to keep the user at a, so want to keep the, the click rate at a certain threshold, but we do want to improve the, the novelty, the unexpectedness in doing the final recommendations. So for the first question, whether the user can ask for unexpectedness or not, the, the answer will be if the user keep, keep clicking on the unexpected recommendations. And here we have this unexpected factor UI and this unexpected factor UI will keep growing and you will tend to get and you will tend to get more and more unexpected recommendations doing your multiple interactions with the system. And to the se second question, the uh, trade-off between the uh, unexpectedness and similarities. So the similarity is so I want I actually want to make one point clear here. So the unexpectedness is very different from the notation of diversity. But diversity has been studied a lot. And diversity actually measures the similarities among the recommended items. But here, the unexpectedness will actually measure the similarities between the recommended items and the user's past history transactions. And that's the key difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pam. I think we're out of time. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, time to move to the next one. Um, can you just uh, share the screen? The next presentation would be uh, made by Hon Young Tang from Tencent, and it's called Progressive Layered Extraction, a novel multitask learning model for personalized recommendations. Uh, Young. Can I start now? Yeah, this is fine. Yeah, go, go ahead. No, you need to get your, we, we don't see your slides. We just share the screen. Can you see it now? Yes. It's fine. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Hong Yan Tang. I'm working at Tencent China. Today, I'm going to introduce our work, Progressive Layer Extraction, a novel multitask learning model for personalized recognition. Nowadays, personalized recommendation plays a crucial role in online applications. Recommender systems generate recommendation sets to maximize user satisfaction. However, user satisfaction is normally hard to tackle directly due to the high dimensionality. Meanwhile, there are many user actions reflecting user interests in recommender systems, such as click, like, share, subscribe, and so on. These actions are factors of user satisfaction and are easier to learn directly. Therefore, in recent years, applying multitask learning to learn various use actions jointly, then fuse them together for final ranking has been the mainstream approach in practice. So let's first look at some common multitask learning structure. Hard parent sharing is the most basic structure. As we can see in the figure, different tasks share the same bottom layers. So hard parent sharing may suffer from performance degeneration when tasks are conflicted. To deal with task conflicts, cross-stitch cross network and SNARS network both propose to learn ways of linear combinations to fuse representations from different tasks. However, fusing weights in cross-stitch and SNARS network are static for all samples, which could not handle sample-dependent correlations. Then in 2018, Google proposed MOE that shares some model as shares some experts at the bottom and combine experts with different gates for different tasks. The gate structure calculates fusing weights based on the input. So MOE achieves adaptive fusion for different samples. However, MOE treats experts equally among all tasks without task specific experts. So it could not capture complex correlations and may bring harmful noise to some tasks. In real world applications, task correlations are often complicated, leading to performance de degeneration known as negative transfer. We also found that when the correlation is even more complex, there could be a seesaw phenomenon that we often improve some tasks at the price of others while trying different multitask learning models. Uh, 
This figure shows the seesaw phenomena in a complex task group VTR and VCR intensive news video recommender system. VTR and VCR are two tasks to predict the probability of valid view and the completion ratio, respectively. The correlation between them is complex due to their coupled definition and the complex, complex scenario of autoplay and click play. In this figure, the single task model is located at the intersection points, um, and, and the model closer to upper right performs better. We can see that no one model lies in the first quadrant completely. In other words, improving VCR or VTR often deteriorates the other task. In addition to VCR and VTR, there are many complex task groups in recommender systems as human behaviors are subtle and complex. Therefore, it is critical to design a more powerful and efficient model to handle complex correlations and eliminate the challenges of all phenomena. So we first introduced a customized gate control model called CGC. CGC separates task specific and shared experts explicitly. The blue boxes in this figure are shared experts. They are intended for learning sharing patterns the red and green ones are task-specific experts to learn task-specific patterns. In CGC, each tower network combines shared experts and its own task-specific experts through a gating network. Thus, the parameters of task-specific experts are only affected by the corresponding task. As shown in the figure, gating network is based on a single layer feedforward network with softmax as the activation function, input as the selector to calculate the weighted sum of selected vectors. Through explicit parameter separation and customized connections, CGC enables different types of experts to concentrate on learning different knowledge. Essentially, multitask learning models need to solve the problem of joint represent representation learning and routing. So we further generalize CGC to progressive layered extraction model called PLE. As shown in the figure, there are multi-level extraction networks in PLE to extract and combine deepest representations for generalization. In each extraction network, besides gates for task-specific experts, um, there is also a gate for shared experts to combine all experts in this layer. So we can see that PLE adopts a progressive separation routine to absorb information from all lower level experts, extract higher level shared knowledge, and dis distribute to specific tower layers progressively, which means that parameters of different tasks in PLE are not fully separated in the early layers as CGC, but are separated progressively in upper layers. This design is a good analogy of the chemical extraction process which can achieve more efficient and flexible joint learning and sharing. To see how CGC and PLE learn task-specific parameters, we compare them with MMOE on expert differentiation. We also extend MMOE to a multi-layer MMOE by adding multi-level experts and gates. In this figure, the width of, the width of bar, each bar and the gates is in proportion to the average gate width of the same color connection. By comparing these bars, we can see that VTR and VCR combine experts with significantly different weights in CGC and PLE, while much similar weights in MMOE and multi-layer MMOE, which indicates that the structure of CGC and PLE enables expert differentiation. Furthermore, there is no zero weight for all experts in MMOE and multi-layer MMOE, which shows that it is hard for them to converge to the structure of CGC and PLE without prior knowledge in practice, despite the theoretical possibility. Finally, we can notice that the higher value, higher layer shared experts in PLE still have big impact on tower layers, especially for the VTR task, larger than in multi-layer MMOE. This shows the mixed demands of separating information and sharing deeper representations in multitask learning. Thus, it is not simply either to be shared or task specific. That's why a progress of fashion fits better. For evaluation, we sampled about 1 billion samples from our video recommender system. In addition to VTR and VCR, 
uh, CDR, SHR, and CMR are other three classification tasks in the data set. Besides AOC and M MSE, we define metric MTL gain as performance improvement of the MTL models compared to the single task model. It is worth noting that 1,000th MTL gain normally contributes significantly online improvements in recommended systems and is practically significant. This table shows the results on VDR and VCR. Due to the complex correlation between these two tasks, we observe a clear seesaw phenomena with the zigzag shaded negative MTO gains. As we can see at the bottom line, our PLE model achieves a double positive MTO gain and significantly outperforms other models and single task model as well. Therefore, PLE eliminates negative transfer and seesaw phenomena successfully. We can then further evaluate PLE on a task group of CDR and VCR with normal correlation. As you can see from the table, there is no seesaw phenomena. In this scenario, CDC and PLE still significantly outperform all state-of-the-art models on both tasks, which verifies that the benefit of CDC and PLE is generic, improving tasks of both complex and regular correlations. This table shows the results of online A-B testing in our video recommender system. We can see that PLE achieves significant increase in total watch time and total view counts of all baseline models. From the results of more challenging scenarios with multiple tasks in this table, CGC and PLE achieve significant improvements over the single task model nearly on all tasks of all task groups which shows the consistent improvements of CGC and PLE across different sets of task groups. Then we try some public data sets. The left is the synthetic data in different correlations and the right are census income and early CCP. We can see that PLE consistently performs best for both tasks across different correlations and different applications. In conclusion, we propose a PLE model that separates shared and task-specific experts explicitly, introduces multi-level customized connections with a novel progressive separation routine. Experiments show that PLE outperforms state-of-the-art multitask learning models, eliminates the negative transfer and seesaw phenomena across different task correlations, task group sizes, and applications. That's all, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. And the first question is from Ying Li, who asked, since we have more experts in this model, will the parameters and training inference time increase a lot? In other words, what is sort of the uh, uh, complexity of your method uh, uh, in terms of the yeah. number of experts in the model? Yes, although it seems that PLE has more experts and parameters than MMOE. However, the number of experts in MMOE is a half a parameter and it, it can be equal or even, even larger than the total number of experts in PLE. In our experiment, we try many different type of parameters and report the best results for each model. So the improvements of PLE owing to its novel structure and progressive separation route instead of the number of parameters. Okay, thank you. And the second question is from Louis Wang, who asked, can the shared experts control how each expert contributes for different tasks? Uh, yes, it's a good question. Um, I think the, uh, the shared experts are, are responsible for learning sharing patterns between these two tasks. And the task-specific experts is, are responsible for learning the task-specific uh, task specific patterns, which is not interfered by the other task. OK, thanks. And this third question is, again, from Louis Wang. Since it's multi-layer models, do you compare the training inference speed? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Multi-layer models, uh, actually in our experiments, uh, for, for single layer models, uh, 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 each model is, 
is composed of the expert and the tower layers, actually. So uh, for the sing in our experiments, for the single layer uh, model, uh, uh, the, the expert is a single layer network and the tower layer is, is a two-layer two network. But in the multi-layer experts, uh, the expert is, is also a single-layer expert and the tower layer is one layer, is also a single-layer expert. So the total depth of the network is, is three in our experiment. Uh, we are out of time and thank you Hong Yang for your interesting talk. Uh, now we're moving to the next presentation of this session. It is called Key Red Knowledge Aware Document Representation for News Recommendations, and the presenter will be Don Yang Leo. Don Yang. Hi. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah, please go. Uh, I think I can start. Hi, I'm Daniel Liu from University of Science and Technology of China and the Microsoft Research Asia. I'm very glad to present our work called Knowledge Aware Documentary Representation for News Recommendations with you. Uh, here is the outline of my presentation. Uh, at the era of internet, the volume of articles can be overwhelming to users, so it is important to offer high quality news recommendation service. And news articles are highly condensed and contains a lot of knowledge entities. This, uh, this entity is open source at the keywords in the news article. Uh, with the uh, help of the knowledge graph, we can have a better understanding of these news articles. Uh, meanwhile, uh, different entities carry uh, different information and uh, share uh, the short uh, different uh, importances in, in news articles. So how, how to live using these knowledge entities is not drivable. Different from the traditional recommender systems, a uh, news express, uh, express soon. So ID based uh, methods like collaborative filtering uh, uh, do not work in, under this situation. So understand, uh, understanding the news content is very important for news recommendation. Uh, recently, many pre trained language models like BORT and ERNI has been proposed. So this present language model trained on very large corpus and uh, so they can offer a good understanding of the news contents. Uh, previous models uh, uh, like uh, DKN realized, uh, rely on specific model structure and cannot combine the knowledge entities and with the present document embeddings. So it is, it is necessary to study how to combine the the language models and the knowledge information. A news recommendation service in application not only include a user to item recommendation, we also have other news recommendation tasks like item to item recommendation, news category classification, news popularity prediction, and local news detection tasks. So these news uh, recommendation tasks uh, are related and can share some inf information uh, uh, by between tasks by entities. So it is necessary to bring these tasks together. Uh, here is an overview of our proposed model. Uh, we proposed the, uh, the required model. Uh, the, the model mainly contains of two parts. Uh, the uh, representation enhanced part and the multitask learning part. Uh, I will introduce the, uh, them in detail. Uh, our, our representation enhanced part contains of the three layers. The first layer is uh, a knowledge uh, an enhanced layer inspired by the knowledge graph attention network. Uh, in this in this layer, we not only consider the ent ent entities in the news itself, but also the neighborhoods of the entities in the knowledge graph. Uh, we use the trans E method to train the embeddings of the entities and the relations in the knowledge graph. Uh, 
And the second layer is a context embedding layer. We observe that an entity may appear in the different documents in various ways, such as the position, frequency, uh, and the category of the uh, entity itself. We design the three context embedding features to enhance the dynamic content, context of the entity. Uh, the third layer is the uh, information distillation layer. The final importance of an entity is not only determined by its own message, but also influenced by the, the other entities in the news article and the topic of the article. So uh, we use an attentive mechanism to uh, merge all the entities' information to one output vector. Uh, we follow the method of the query key and the value uh, of the transformer. Uh, the second part of the, our model is the multitask learning part. Uh, we found that this, uh, ta this task share some knowledge patterns and uh, their data can, uh, and they can complement with each other. So thus we design a multitask learning approach to train the credit model. Uh, in the multitask uh, framework, all the, task, all the tasks sh uh, sh shares the uh, backbone model, but on the top of the uh, model, they have some uh, uh, task uh, uh, specific layers as the uh, predictors. Uh, here is the experiment part. And, uh, here is the, the statistics of the data set we used. Uh, our data comes from uh, Microsoft News. Um, uh, we use uh, Microsoft Satori as our knowledge graph. And uh, we also published a large scale news data set named MAN after this paper. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a video, uh, available now. So if you are interested in the news foundation, you can use our published data set. Uh, we compare with uh, three groups of the baseline method. The first of the group is the traditional recommendation method, including uh, FM and uh, right and deep and uh, uh, state of the art news recommendations uh, named the normal. Uh, the second group is the knowledge of my implementation method, including uh, DKN, STCK, and the learning. The third group is the variance of the credit model. We use the two kinds of basic uh, embeddings, uh, LDA plus uh, DSSM and the board. We want to study the importance of the uh, ways to injecting knowledge information. DV means uh, we do not use knowledge entities, and the DV plus entity means we combine the DV and the entities using a, a attentive pooling method. Acquired a single task means we train the task in a single uh, task manner. Uh, here is the experiment the results of the user to item uh, recommendation tasks. Uh, the results show that uh, knowledge entities are indeed very important for a uh, new recommendation. Uh, this can be verified from the uh, from uh, both uh, LDA plus DSSM and the board. And the DV plus entity are better than DV uh, shows an, uh, uh, shows the entity is, uh, is useful for the new recommendation task and the uh, credit model further improve the DV plus entity by a large uh, performance, so which means our model can fuse the entity, uh, knowledge entity uh, better. Uh, here is the experiment results for other four new stream recommendation tasks. We can observe a very si similar results of the uh, user to item tasks. And we did a validation studies of the three key layers in the current model. We remove one layer each time and test if the, if the performance is dropped. Here is the result. We, we, we can see that uh, you remove each layer will cause a significant performance drop, which indicates uh, all the layers are necessary. And uh, we compare the time cost of the training and the inferring of the current model with the 
RTCN 的 TCN module in the DTN. Uh, unlike the TCN and the SCN to model the full text content, or create fixed aggreg aggregated information of entities as a, uh, additional input, so it's uh, much faster in, for both the training and the infer inference steps. Uh, so to better understand uh, the quality of the document representation, we conduct uh, realization studies on the document embeddings. Here is the figure. Uh, each point represents a document, uh, and the documents are donated with different colors based on their categories. Uh, we can observe that the document with the same category tend to cluster together, and uh, our embedding uh, it have a better distribution than the world and the RDA model. Uh, we provide a case study on the attention score of the credit model that uh, will assign to different entities. And uh, how, a same, same, uh, how a same entity will take uh, different uh, importance scores in different uh, documents. Uh, we, uh, we select the two articles uh, which have which, uh, share some uh, common entities and, uh, in this figure. Uh, you can see a, a new article may mention the dozens of entities, where only a few of them are key entities. And, uh, and uh, actually, the same entities uh, in, in the different uh, uh, articles shows the different importance in the, in the same time. Uh, here is the conclusion. Uh, we propose the credit model, which can enhance the representation of news with the entity information. And, uh, uh, there are three uh, component layers in our proposed credit model, the entity representation layer, and the content embedding layer, and the information destination layer. And uh, we study the five key uh, applications for new recommendation and uh, propose a multi-task learning framework. And uh, we open source the, our, our, our project here. And, uh, in the future, we will study how to use the knowledge graph to enhance the user representation, and we want to use the knowledge graph for reasoning use representation. Uh, thanks, Harry. Uh, this is my talk. Uh, thank you, Dan Yang. We have a question for you from Mohit Sharma, uh, who asked, do you have any insights on how the, does distillation help in the modeling? Uh, uh, actually, uh, different uh, entities uh, will show the different, can have uh, different importance in different articles. So uh, for example, um, maybe th this new article is uh, talk about uh, uh, a specific uh, uh, an entity, uh, for example, about uh, America, and uh, maybe the other article mentioned America in, in at the end, and uh, uh, they just uh, mentioned this entity, and uh, so we we want to use the uh, original document uh, vector to supervise uh, uh, each uh, entity's importance, since uh, the original document vector already has a topic and uh, some very important information. So, so this, uh, this vector can uh, supervise this uh, uh, different uh, entities' uh, importance. Uh, uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? All right, then I have a question. You did the ablation studies and you removed various like uh, uh, layers in your model. Have you considered yeah. other type of ingredients in your ablation studies? Yes. Uh, sorry, pardon. Uh, have you co considered other components uh, to be used oh, in your ablation studies? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, actually, we uh, we did the multitask ablation study. Uh, in this, in our framework, we studied, uh, we used the single task and uh, the multitask. And uh, you can see in my experiment, uh, experiment results, uh, we also did the, uh, we removed the other 
uh, tasks and uh, see if the multitask can can have the uh, model training. Yes. Okay. Thanks. And then yeah, we are out of time. Uh, we need to move to the next presentation. Thank you for your talk. Uh, our ne next presentation is called FISA using item similarity models with self-attention networks for sequential recommendation. And the presenter is Jing Ling. Jing. Hey, hello. Uh, uh, now I start my talk. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Lin Jing. I'm a postgraduate from Shenzhen University. In this presentation, I'm going to introduce our work, FISA, using item similarity models with self potential networks for sequential recommendation. In this paper, we focus on two issues for sequential recommendation. Firstly, we notice that as deep learning based methods being widely adopted to model the local and dynamic preference beneath users' behavior sequences, the modeling of users' global and stack deep preferences tend to be underestimated. And secondly, most existing methods hold an assumption that users' intention can be fully captured by considering the historical behaviors, while neglecting the possible uncertainty of users' intention in reality, which may be influenced by the appearance of the candidate's items. To solve these two issues, we propose a novel solution named FISA, which contains three main components, a local representation learning module, a global representation learning module, and a gating module to balance these two kinds of representation. Our FISA not only joins the effective global representation learning to the well-established SAS rec model, but also balances the user's short-term and long-term interest for each candidate item. Empirical study shows that our FISA achieves state-of-the-art performance and surpasses SAS rec by about 10% on average. Here's the related work, including some general recommendation method and some sequential recommendation methods. The problem we study can be formalized as shown here. We denote the records of each user as an item sequence, then predict the next interacted item for each user. Now let me introduce our FISA with more details. The architecture network, the, the network the network architecture of our proposed visa can be shown in this figure. We can see that the local representation learning module and the global representation learning module share the same embedding matrix of the input sequence. Then the local representation and global representation learned by these two modules are weighted by the gating module to form the final representation. First of all, we fix the input sequence of each user by extracting his L, latest L behaviors. Then we present, we present the input sequence as an embedding of as an embedding matrix of size L multiplies D, where each row vector is a learnable item embedding. Then for local representation learning, we follow SAS rec to use a self-attention network consists of a series of stacked self-attention blocks. Note that in the self-attention layer, in the self-attention blocks, we adopt the causality mask to preserve the transitions from previous steps only. In this module, we take the output vector XL from the top self-attention block as the local representation at the L step. Then for global representation learning, we notice that the local representation still ignores the variable ordering of the current item and its subsequent items. This inspires us to generate a global and uncautious representation of each user's behavior sequence, as FISM does. In FISM, sequence with similar items tend to have similar representations. We believe that this effect can be enhanced if more representative items are noticed. So, Instead of an aggregation with, with average rating, we introduce a learnable query vector shared by all sequences to obtain our global representation learning module as the location-based attention layer as shown here. 
Note that different from the local representation learning module, the position information and the causality constraint are abandoned here. It's also worth mentioning that a drop-up layer is very important during the training to generalize the global representation to all steps. In this way, we propose an attentive version of FISM for global representation learning in sequential recommendation. To combine the local representation and the global representation, we choose a summation operation based on our early attempts. As mentioned earlier, existing approaches of combination are still based on the historical information only, which may be idealistic because users and intention can be uncertain. And we think that the proper way to tell whether a new item can attract a user is to consider how it can arouse different parts of the user's intention. For example, the short-term part or the long-term part. Inspired by NICE, we propose an item similarity gating module, which calculates the weight of the global representation and local representation by modeling the item similarity between candidate item and the recently interacted item as well as the item similarity between the candidate item and the equation of the historical items. Here's the item similarity gating function, which outputs a gating value restricted from zero to one to represent the importance of the local representation. Then the final representation of the sequence at the L step is obtained by the weighted sum of the corresponding local representation XL and global representation as shown here. Note that SAS thread and the attentive version of FISM is also included as special cases in our FISA. Finally, we predict the preference of item I being the L plus one item in the sequence as the vector product between the final representation and the candidate item embedding. We train our FISA by minim minimizing the binary cross entropy loss. In the experiment section, we study four research questions as follows. To study these four questions, we adopt five public data sets and the leave one out evaluation. We evaluate the recommendation performance via record at 10 and NDCG at 10. Our baseline includes four matrix factorization-based methods and four deep learning-based methods. Note that such thread here also work as the local representation learning module in our FISA. Here's some implementation details. And the overall result is shown in this table. We can see that our FISA achieved the best performance on all the five data sets compared with all the baselines, with clearly demonstrate the superiority of our proposed model. Here are some other observations. And we also carry out an ablation study. We can see that the hybrid models always outperforms the separated ones, and our item similarity gating further improves the results to obtain the best performance in most cases. This demonstrates the complementary effect between the local and global representation in our FISA and the better effectiveness of our item similarity gating for balancing the local and global representation. For quantitative study, we turn the latent dimensionality and the numbers of self-attention block. We also study the non-causality design of our global representation learning module. We find that the causality consideration for global representation learning becomes redundant for hybrid model. This also demonstrates the advantage of introducing the future information for global representation learning in our FISA. At last, we adjust, we adjust the input and output of the gating function. Based on the result, we suggest to keep both, both kinds of historical representation as inputs for universality. And for output, we suggest an individual level gating because the feature level gating may bring instability. Here's the summary of our work. We 
we propose a novel solution named FISA by designing an attentive version of FISA for global representation and a gating network to balance these two kinds of representations. And we carry out some interesting studies on our FISA. Here's the direction of our future work. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, there is a question uh, from uh, San Min Cho, who asked, have you compared FISA with other baselines such as Barrett for REC, which is better than SAS REC? Uh, 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 what is the new baseline you mentioned? Uh, 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 Barrett for REC. Barrett for REC. Oh, uh, yes, uh, as mentioned in our paper, uh, uh, first, uh, we think is actually a model to um, uh, improve the local representation learning for sequential recommendation. And this is not our focus in this paper. So we just uh, choose SASREX as our baseline. And uh, we take another new baseline, uh, this car model here. And this is a model to improve SAS right by also also by considering some global representation and uh, balancing methods. Uh, okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, all right, if there are no other questions, then I would like to thank uh, Jing Lin uh, for her presentation and it's time to move for the next uh, uh, presentation by Philippe Ferreira, uh, investigating multi multimodal features for video recommendations at Global Play. Yeah, that's fine. Please go. Yeah, yeah. We, we, can you can you speak again because we can't hear you, Philip? Hello, everyone. I need to be here. It's a pleasure. Uh, we, we can't hear you too well. Can you maybe move closer? Or we, we can't Thank hear you, you well. It's a pleasure to be virtually at Rexis, presenting the initial results of our research. And currently, I'm a machine learning specialist at Google, and teach the students at Wikipedia. In this talk, I'm going to explain shortly about our preliminary results, the obtaining and investigating multimodal features for video recommendations at Google This is a joint work with Daniel Souza, Igor Moura, Matheus Barbieri, and my advisor, Professor Ed Moss. In addition, we would like to thank all the people involved who have contributed to this work anyway, especially our recommendation team and our UX team. Now, talking briefly about Global News. Our company is the largest Latin American media company with the most popular news portal in Brazil. One of our main products is Global Play. We are leaders in audience and one of the main technology companies in Brazil. Our main offices in Rio de Janeiro, other offices are in Porto Alegre, São Paulo, and Recife. We have more than 100 million unique users per month. It's equivalent to 85% of internet users in Brazil. So in content, we are leaders in Brazil. Before we move on, I'd like to introduce Global Play. Global Play is a global digital video stream platform with a very diverse video content catalog, ranging from international to Brazilian production, such as movies, series, soap operas, TV programs, and etc. Naturally, such platforms bring lots of challenges. For example, the distribution of large and diverse content collection to the user base, help our subscribers with find relevant content that match their expectations, increase user engagement with the product. In this context, recommendation systems 
play a fundamental strategic role in content promotion at global pace. The main reason is because they are able to infer through artificial intelligence algorithms, such as collaborative filtering, what are the most relevant videos for users. This approach has shown good results when both users and video already have a consumption history and doesn't make use of any information about the content of the video it itself. But on scenarios where new videos are uploaded daily to the platform, alongside an expanded user base, approaches like collaborative filtering fail to establish our recommendations due to the lack of consumption history of both users and videos. We identified as a business problem that our video content-based algorithms were not satisfactory and competitive because we had a lack of video metadata. We depended on annotation that were manually made by the editors, which is a very expensive and time-consuming task. On the other hand, and the raw video and all the streams associated with video files contains a rich multimodality information that can be leveraged to overcome items and user code start situations. This motivated us to start using state-of-art machine learning algorithms to extract more sophisticated features from video content. Now talking briefly about our method. To speed up our research, we decided to start using super trained models from previous studies in the literature. As image feature structure, we used a C3D model trained on Sport One main dataset. As audio feature structure, we used a VGG model trained on Google audio set. And with this, we proposed the following pipeline, which is composed of a video embed structure and the recommendation generator. The first step is when a new video arrives at the platform. We start two processes in parallel, a keyframe structure, which is responsible for sampling one frame per scene and generate a frame sequence as output, and the log mail structure, which is responsible for processing the audio segment to calculate the log mail spectrogram as output. In the second step, use the pre-trained models to extract features. As the image feature structure is a C3D model that receives a frame sequence as input, and output the average result of the last convolutional layer. Use this output as a video level feature representations. Following the same idea, the audio feature structure is a VGG model that receives the log mail spectrogram and extracts the last convolutional layer as audio level feature representation. To produce an embedded representation for each video, we train a separated five layer deep neural network with fully connected layers. This network receive the concatenation of the aforementioned video and the audio level representation as input for a proxy task of multi-level classification to infer genre, content rating, and suitable age. After this process, we use the output of the four layer as the final video embedding representations. We obtain the final recommendations by computing the cosine similarity between features obtained by processing video using this embedded structure. The result of cosine similarity is used to establish a rank of top and most similar videos in the collection. Now let's talk about the preliminary results of our experiment. Our UX team conducted a qualitative study to gather uh, user feedback regarding our method and to get a better understanding on the human tasks of describing and comparing video content. Users were recruited based on two categories, 12 expert users who have specialized knowledge related to video content, and 12 regular users who do not have a specialized knowledge. We created an interface that allowed users to perform a few tasks to evaluate recommendations generated by our method. For most users, our method managed to deliver satisfactory content-based recommendations even though they questioned the deliver some recommended videos that apparently were not similar to the base video. However, most users were interested in watching these seemingly unrelated titles, and after watching them, the users realized that the titles were somewhat similar after all, and they enjoyed watching them. Here, we have some important factors we observed about users' perceptions when comparing and describing video content characteristics. Users were considered that uh, users considered that a good content-based recommendations understand the nuance of content, such as combination of genre, some genres, th and themes, 
For example, action with superheroes or comedy with superheroes. Or different moods with the same within the same genre of themes. For example, romance with happy ending or romance with sad ending. Information related to the narrative structure help users to decide if it, what is the an experience experience in which they are willing to engage at the moment. Series with an independent episodes or seasons are identified by the central themes that's used in the stories of the episodes. Visual characteristics such as video color palette, for example, were mentioned as features that help to get a sense of content and character's mood. Audio characteristics like soundtrack were mentioned as similar factors when evaluating recommendations. In addition, we create an A-B test in production, comparing the method against the most traditional TF-EDF similarity using subtitles. In general, we observed a positive lift in our, our business metric related to video when using the new, this new content-based method. For example, as, as you can see here, we got a CTR with 16%, a user engagement with 5%, and click with play with 39%. And finally, our conclusions and future work. As a conclusion, our preliminary study suggests that multimodality modality features leads to good impressions in recommended items to users. Genres, themes, moods, narrative structure, visual and audio characteristics were mentioned when comparing and describing video content. And we got an interesting positive lift in our business metric related to video when using this new content-based method against the TFDF approach. As future works, we are planning to explore more methods to extract audiovisual features, define best approach to combine text, audio, and visual features, combine this feature with other methods, for example, uh, a session-based or sequential-based approach, and etc., and do more A-B testing and evaluations. So I'd like to thank you for attending my presentation. And if you have any question, or even if you, have, uh, if you are interested in more detail regarding our research, please drop a message for me or our UX lead, Daniel Souza. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Philip. Uh, you have a question from Pascual Martinez Gomez. How I image features across frames integrated into a single feature vector? Okay, excellent, great questions. We uh, do the compute computational reasons. We tried to uh, reduce the amount, the great, the huge amount of frames that is present in the video content, right? So before we uh, feed the, the, the feature for the model, we process the, the entire video using a Pycene detect, that's a tool that uh, detects uh, scenes or, sh or uh, shots in videos. So we tried to keep only one frame per scene that is reducing drastically our amount of frames. And using one frame for scenes, it would take a sampling of these frames to, uh, uh, to, to create the, the sequence frames for the, the, the C3D model. Uh, it's about uh, 16 frames that is very few at the first moment, but uh, this, this speed up our research because uh, this turns out that to, this, this uh, can speed up the processing video. For example, we spend the, the video processing this in, the, in this pipeline got uh, about uh, one or two minutes if, for, for even for a long video. So we try to keep one frame per scene and create this uh, frame sequence to input for the CTD model. After that, we, we process the, role, the entire pipeline to extract these pictures using the, the, the convolutional in 3D model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the second question comes from Zimin Park, who asked, please explain more about the meaning of user engagement. Uh, okay, so uh, we had a uh, is our specific metric that we take in consideration, for example, the play time, the amount of time users are spending in our systems, and the frequency that, user, that user, our users are visiting the product. So we have some, we have some, we are making some calculations with these features. 
and that we have a nice final score for that user. So we, uh, if you drop a message, I can send you our paper because we have a, a, a data scientist, data scientist group inside Global that uh, published this this interesting uh, metric calculation. So uh, I can send you if you are interested in more details. If you drop a message after this 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 meeting. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Mohit Sharma, who asked, how does metadata based feature like genre performs when compared against only audio video features? It's a select excellent questions. Um, um, I try to explain uh, um, uh, as this Basically, we are using the genre, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the content uh, criteria, age criteria, and suitable age. Uh, this is a, a multi task, a multi output classification algorithm that we are training. Uh, but uh, we need to understand more how can the genre uh, is, is, is so useful for us because. As you have, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning of my presentation, that we, ha we have a, 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 a problem with a lack of metadata. For example, we have uh, videos that even ha have a, any information about the genre, right? So we decide to uh, separate a, a, a subset of the well uh, uh, with a, a very stable annotated metadata to train our model. So. We need now, we, right now, we need to uh, understand and uh, to investigate more how can we benefit more with genre because uh, we are interested in, in, in depend less with this metadata and, and investing more in on unsupervised learning, for example, that we can leverage and, and, and avoid this kind of problem. So it's need, we need to, in, in general, to, to, to resume my, my answer is, uh, we need to investigate more about how can we leverage this, this genre. We, we need to analyze in, in, a more, in more detail to understand better. Okay, Philip, thanks. And the next question comes from Masahiro Sato, who asked, how much is the contribution of each modality? Which modality was most effective? Great questions. <laughs> At the moment, I, I have no answer for this 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 question because uh, we need to. It's, it's the first ta first uh, try using uh, multi modality, but we have we have a goal that you you are very interested if in this research inside global that we you are interested to leverage, for example the audio uh, part and the for example because uh, we have some some users that reported that uh, oh i like it, this video because this makes some nostalgic feelings so this soundtrack is very interesting so this remember my team when i was teenager so it's good feeling for me so this kind of uh, sentiment uh, this feeling is very important it and can uh, bring us uh, some uh, good evidence of user preference that's it is our, uh, our final uh, goals for this research. So we have no idea right now, but I'm, we are very interested to go in deeper in the same barrier. How can I pro, uh, uh, use it or, or analyze how, how the different features can can be more pro, uh, more weighted for, for uh, a specific user and et cetera. Thank you. The next question comes from Allegro Latimer who asked, how does this new method compared to established content-based filtering methods such as deep neural network used by youtube and others yes so uh, it's a great question also um uh, we need to make in fact we need to make more more uh, experimentation to comparing uh, this more sophisticated method um we, we don't have we still don't have make this comparison uh, so we have no we still have no numbers to show uh, to to give for this but we have uh, some preliminary results against the uh, most basic content based method but our our goal is also to uh, leverage this kind of feature to to feed up in the for example in a sequence or content based or session based recommendations so how can i create an uh, uh, item representation with this content with that features uh, thank you, Philippe. 
Uh, I think people asked lots of good questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. We need to move to the next presentation. And I would like you to thank you for your interesting presentation. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you. Our next presentation is by Jacopa Tagliaube, uh, which is called the embeddings that came in from the cold, improving vectors for new and rare products with content-based inference. Uh, Jacopo. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Awesome, awesome. Um, hi, thanks so much uh, for being here. I hate to be the one um, between you and Netflix, not the company talking, but probably watching a movie relaxing uh, if it's night in your time zone as it is in mine. So I'll try to be brief. Um, the uh, work we will present today is a collaboration between industry and academia. In particular, it's me and uh, Christine from Coveo. I think Christine is also on the line. So if you have hard questions, she'd be Super happy to answer to you at the end. And then Federico uh, from Bocconi University in Italy. The topic of today is the mixture between embeddings and the cold start problem that I'm sure you're all familiar with in the recommendation uh, literature. Um, long story short, dense product presentation, that is product embeddings have been exceptionally successful in a lot of e-commerce related tasks in this, I would say last three, four years, uh, recommendation, NLP, personalization, and so on and so forth. Uh, representation of objects produced by embeddings tends to be very high quality for products for which you have a lot of interaction, but tends to be less so spectacular for real products. And of course, new products have no representation at all, right? Because they're not to be found in the, in the set of interaction. So our open question is, how do we pick the elegance and the flexibility of dense representation that can be either used by themselves, for example, k &N to provide um, like an easy and fast recommendation, or they can be used for downstream tasks. So how can we pick this elegance and make sure that the quality of this representation does not degrade excessively in the cold start scenario? Um, today, we're trying to answer this question and we show uh, what is our recipe to solve this problem. In particular, and it seems to be said uh, in the very beginning, in a multi-tenant SaaS scenario. What do I mean? Uh, many companies, for example, our friends from Globo just before us, um, build recommendation for an e-commerce or for a website that they own and they control end-to-end. Is their website, is their user, is their data. Uh, our situation at Coveo is fairly different. We are a SaaS provider, which means that we build recommendations for other um, uh, e-commerce, other websites, and so on, which means that the amount of things we can control is somewhat limited. And the way in which we measure our success is sure in the accuracy of our solution, but very importantly, in how the solution scales across a variety of country, languages, traffic, um, and so on and so forth. We're gonna see how we test for that in our, in our presentation. Um, so the first thing to do is to check, uh, like a small reminder, what is uh, product embeddings. Um, if you're familiar with Ortovec from the NLP literature, Protovec is exactly the same model. We actually train in the same library, Gensim in Python, you probably know it. Uh, the idea here is that we swap the concept of word in a sentence with product in a shopping session. And you basically, <clears throat> through a skip gram model, you basically build dense representation for product. Um, the uh, optimization problem you solve, again, is exactly the same as, as, uh, as, um, uh, as word to back. Uh, and it's a very try and tested uh, um, uh, method to obtain a good uh, low dimensional representation for words in the case of NLP or products in the case of e-commerce. So when you train a product to back space, the result is basically a multidimensional space in which similar products appear to be closer in the embedding space. Uh, if you see here, this is a three-dimensional Disney projection uh, for one of our um, for our partner partner shop is a um, uh, is a shop is a sport apparel shop, and then you can see here we color coded each of the dots, which is product. Each each dot is a product and is color coded with the sport activity related to this product. For example, running shoes are like things that are shoes are violet, and you see they're clustered together in the space. Things that are light blue are soccer, and so on and so forth. As you can see here, this complete and supervised method to produce latent representation of product work fairly well in kind of distinguish, uh, you know, important semantic properties of the, uh, of the uh, product. If we inspect some products in this space, you're gonna find um, the, a huge disparity in the quality of particular representation. So on the left here, running shoes, which is the most popular product in this, um, in the shop, uh, if you inspect the neighbors of these shoes, these shoes tend to be other shoes. 
So we, we, can, we can readily see that the quality of this representation is fairly high. When you go to somewhat like a rarer product, for example, a GPS running watch, you see that the representation is somehow give you mixed results. Like GPS product, but you know, also like a, like a GoPro, like still, like, I don't know, I, on the accessory kind of thing, but obviously less quality than the, um, than the sneaker case. And of course, new products have no interaction at all, which means they are nowhere to be found in the space. So our solution uh, in a nutshell, and then we're gonna see a bit more in detail, is to basically produce a mixed embedding space in which we keep the uh, embedding, the vectors for the popular products because they're high quality. And you actually swap the embedding of the rare products or the new products with, with embeddings that you calculated starting from the content of the catalog. So what we do, we take popular products only for which we know we have a good representation in the latent space. For example, the pair of shoes. We go into the catalog and we extract text from metadata, name, category, brand, description, whatever. We pass them through a standard sentence birth encoding. We concatenate all the, um, uh, all the information. Uh, and then we basically build a multi-input encoder mapping this representation through the final embedding space. In particular, we're basically learning a function between the content uh, of, the, of the product and its position in the latent space, which again, as we saw before, captures some of the latent semantic properties of this product. What we do now, we take, for example, our GPS watch, which we deem to be like a rare product for a product for which we don't really trust the behavioral based embeddings. And now we apply the encoder that we learned we apply it to the um, catalog information for the GPS watch and we map it to the space. To check if the mixed embeddings space works better than the normal embeddings, uh, we test the robustness of our approach in our multi-tenant scenario, which means that instead of testing on one website, we actually pick three websites from our partnering uh, shops from our network that differ massively um, in, in so far as the Alexa rank, the traffic, the industry, the number of SKU, and also the session that are needed to train their product to back. So we run two experiments. The first experiment to evaluate the quality of the embedding is a standard next event prediction task, which is again, pretty standard in the product embedding literature. The model is an LSTM, uh, which is vanilla because we are not evaluating complex model. We're just trying to evaluate the quality of the embeddings. And the task is very simple. You're giving a shopping session that the model is not seen in training, uh, the shopping session has n elements. We're gonna we're gonna feed to the LSTM the first n minus one, and we're gonna ask to predict what is the what is the nth element of the of the um, of the sequence. So we test the original behavioral product embedding against the mixed space that I that I that I that I uh, described before. So we have behavioral product embedding, which is a product embedding as you know vanilla product space with all the uh, vectors that are created by behavioral uh, interaction, and then we have on the other side the mixed product space that we just described and we report a uh, standard measure for the prediction and for the red products as well. As you can see here, while the prediction for the overall, um, uh, for the overall accuracy is pretty much stable across the three shops and across the two methods, the prediction for the red item is significantly better with our method. The experiment number two um, is um, about the quality of the, of the red embeddings when we're actually wrong. In particular, first, when we use um, um, vectors for downstream task, or when we show like product using vectors directly, um, interview with our customer tell us that it's very important for us to be not just, you know, okay, not just, not just right, but when we're not right, when we're not, when we're not predicting right height and we want to be reasonably wrong. Take this good example, for example, first case is a, the target in the, in the, in the test set is a, is, a, is a pair of sneakers. The prediction is not exactly the same pair of sneakers, but it's still an acceptable solution. Well, in the second case, the target is a socks and they're pretty gloss, which is very wrong. What we want to do, we want to make sure that we try to, um, to, to make sure that the final user experience is coherent. So when we're trying to assess this by measuring the average cosine distance when we make a mistake between the original space and the mixed space. As you can see here in all three shop, the mixed space is consistently better as when we make a mistake, the distance in the, in the underlying embedding space between the right item and the wrong item is actually significantly lower. So conclusion, um, so our solution is a very scalable solution to the cold embedding problem in a multi-tenant SaaS provider. Um, couple of items that are interesting is more general, the latent recommendation model, as in we actually get the usual product to vacuum you can use downstream 
as you were using the previous behavior of Protvec. It does not require, which is very important for us, replacing existing infrastructure as the interface application between layers stays the same. For downstream application, there's no difference between a behavioral embedding or a synthetic embedding. And finally, it builds the accuracy directly on dense representation built by other model. In our case, sentence bird. But of course, you can thinking of improving that with you know, adding image vector or other sort of metadata. As the next step, we look forward to leverage the hierarchical structure, basically the category tree that is found in most catalogs and see if we can even uh, improve even further our solution. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Jacopo. Uh, we have a few questions uh, from the audience. The first question comes from Parin Joganwala. And the question is, what is the training data for F looks like? What are the labels? The, there, there are no labels. So what we're trying to do is basically we're regressing like this, the, the, the concatenation of the textual feature as passed through a sentence bird and a bunch of, and a, and a bunch of other embedding layers. Uh, I mean, the details are in the paper, but like the, the idea here is that you have this representation of the text of the content from one side, and on the other side, you have the position in the embedding space of popular items. You know which items are popular because you can basically count. And then based on the observation and popular items have very good quality representation where basically be the regressor from the content space as embedded through Trubert and the Latin space. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Chris Sinatra. Uh, are there any issues with generating simulated embeddings for items in different categories that may have different text metadata features, such as watches and shoes? Um, in theory, yes, that is a very good question. For example, if all watches, for whatever reason, tends to be rare or, or new, of course, what you're learning from the previous, the, the, the encoder that I just mentioned is probably not gonna be easy to generalize, but as a practical thing, at least in all the shops that we try, this thing doesn't really happen, as in for many, I wouldn't say categories, but for many semantic region of the space, there typically are some popular products that you can exploit to learn better representation for the real products in the same space. But theoretically, yes, it's totally possible that the method does not generalize to that case. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Ali Roshan Gias, and how are you learning the title embeddings from popular titles? Are you using MSE laws? Uh, yes, again, as I, I think the, the question is related to, to the first one. We, we're, we're just basically trying to regress, like to, to minimize the, um, the, yes, the loss in, the, in this regression from the sentence bird representation to the latent space that we already have. And that's basically it. We, ne we didn't try with images. We should probably add some uh, accuracy to the overall method. But what we're trying to prove here is mostly, is there an effective and scalable way in which we can improve what we already have, which is prot to vec infrastructure, without requiring us to change the infrastructure. If you're familiar with meta prot to vec for example, which is awesome, but it will require a lot more engineering than what this method would require. Okay, great, thanks. The next question comes from Foakley and, uh, when using prod to work, we assumed the products already have some minimal traffic. But for cold start scenario, this assumption may not be held. How do you overcome this issue? Yeah, ex exactly. So the, 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 po the point, for the, the point for, the, uh, for the minimal traffic or the existing traffic is that we're not really relying on the prod to back space but we're relying on what we call the synthetic embeddings that are produced by our mapping. Um, and as we, as we saw in the, in, the, in the NDCG evaluation, this gives us significant improvement, both in the accuracy and even when we're wrong in how reasonably wrong we are in doing that. Okay, thanks. The next question comes from Zimin Park. Could you explain hyperparameters of sentence bird? such as layer, epoch, dim? Uh, you, so I don't, I, I, yeah, no, I, yeah, no, no, I, I, yes, I, I, I don't remember the exact, the exact numbers, but I'm super, I'm super happy to, I mean, they're in the papers, but I'm super happy to, to give it, to give it to you. Uh, it's, it's all, it's all documented. Uh, it's yeah. fairly, it's fairly straightforward though. It's like concatenating the two 
I think we, we if I remember correctly, we, we project down the, the sentence verb to like a hundred, um, to like a hundred dimension, we concatenate them and then there's a further layer um, uh, of projection uh, before the final, um, the final embedding space. I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't remember that by heart. And then the, they can contact you, you can discuss. Oh yeah, like, I'm, yeah, I'm super easy to find in any, in LinkedIn or whatever, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> And the last question is from Julian Ox. Have you observed issues with overfitting? Um, I mean, not that much. If by overfitting you mean that the model is not able to generalize to unseen uh, part of the, of the space, which I think is relates to the first question. Uh, it's a good question. We didn't actually check that, which is, I think it's a, it's a, good, it's a good thing to do. But I think this relates to the first question, as in, it's theoretically possible that all popular items are, are positioned in the space in such a way that you just learn basically a mapping between the catalog and that part of the space instead of a more general one. I think our result proved that, um, I mean, generally speaking, practically, this was not a concern for our, for our use case, uh, but it may totally be a good, a good point to check. Thanks, Julian, for, for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh... Thanks, Julian. We're out of time. As you observed at the beginning, sort of it's Netflix time now. Uh, I would like to thank you, you and all other speakers for these interesting, insightful presentations. If you want to continue interacting with the guest speakers, you can do it online in, in the forums provided by the organizers. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your interesting presentation. This concludes our session. Yeah.